This podcast is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute professional medical advice. The information presented on this podcast are my own personal views, opinions, and summaries of research. Always consult your physician regarding any medical concerns, conditions, or treatments. Thanks for joining me again for another episode of It's Not You, It's Me, a podcast dedicated to talking about PMDD and related topics. Okay, first of all, how great was that segment on BBC last week about PMDD with Alice and Laura? If you haven't seen it, go watch it. You can find the link on my Twitter. And to have these two women just bravely sharing their stories and facilitating a conversation about PMDD on a show with millions of viewers is incredible. It definitely is the kind of exposure to help spread awareness about this because it affects so many, many women and many don't recognize the symptoms or are still undiagnosed. Also this weekend was the PMDD conference in the UK, which was the first of its kind to bring together PMDD experts, those suffering from PMDD, and others just wanting to know more. And I really wish I could have been there because first of all, UK, how awesome, I've never been. Um, Also, just to have been around all those wonderful PMDD experts, those who are in the same boat and know exactly what it's like. But I'm glad a streaming option was available. Unfortunately, I didn't get a pass. So hopefully those webinars, those workshops will be available on demand to view because I would still pay to see those. And I'm also excited for this week's online presentation of PMDD Positive in conjunction with IAPMD. If you're not registered for this, you can search for it at eventbrite, that's B-R-I-T-E, dot C-O dot U-K. So on this episode, we'll be doing an overview of a guide to coping with premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which was published in 2002, and it was written by James E. Houston, MD, and it's either pronounced Lani or Laney C. Vujitsobo, PhD, and prior to his retirement, Dr. Houston specialized in OB and gynecology, and at the time of the publication, he was lecturing around the U.S. on women's health concerns. Dr. Fujisobo is a private clinical psychologist in Medford, Oregon, and at the time the book was published, she was the associate professor of psychology at Southern Oregon University, though after googling her recently, it looks like she's now professor emeritus, so congratulations on that. (laughs) Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any current info for Dr. Houston. I wanted to read the sentence from the preface because I felt it still resonates with things today. Quote, There is no reason to continue to suffer from the cyclic chaos of PMDD simply because neither you nor your health advisors are well enough informed. End quote. But yet here we are, what, 17 years later after this book was published and many people, including medical professionals, are just now hearing about PMDD for the first time. So we definitely still have a ways to go in creating awareness. Now, the book is directed toward women that are wanting to better understand and take some control over their PMDD experience and for those in healthcare that want to help those women too. And this book has four parts to it, the first being about the nature of PMDD, which includes a review of the menstrual cycle, which is important to know, a description of what PMDD is, risk factors, diagnosis, and what is known and not known about PMDD. That being said, I'd like to ask that you keep in mind that the information this book presents and what I'll be discussing is from 2002, so what they've known up until then. Part two is all about self-help interventions, covering diet, vitamins, weight management and exercise, and integrative medical treatments. Part three is all about medical interventions, which includes talking about medications, stress, cognitive behavioral therapy, and other mood disorders in PMDD. Part four brings it all together, and like the PMDD phenomenon book, it includes some pages aimed at those wanting to support someone with PMDD. And I thought it was really nice touch in the appendix. Um, there was an inclusion of recipes that are aimed to help reduce PMDD symptoms because, you know, there are things that should be avoided uh, during that time and things that you should up your, in- your intake on. A second appendix includes one page uh, list of resources for integrative medical therapies. Now, I can imagine this list being much longer now than what it was 17 years ago. 
There's one sentence on the first page of part one that kind of stopped me, giving the information that's now out now regarding PMDD. But again, try to remember this was written a while back. They say that PMDD is not a mental illness and that they would show the science to support this argument. Just to refresh your memory, PMDD was not classified as a mental disorder until 2013, which was 11 years after this book was published. So on to the chapters. Chapter 1 begins with the overview of the menstrual cycle. Did you know your uterus is about the size of your fist? Yeah, I bet you're looking at your fist right now, huh? <laughs> I did the same thing. There was a helpful little diagram to show how hormones are connected in the menstrual cycle, showing the connection to the glands that produce them too. And this might come in handy as some random trivia one day, but there are three glands involved in the menstrual cycle, the hypothalamus and the pituitary and the ovaries. And they go into the explanation of the menstrual cycle and the involvement of the hormones in a few paragraphs and then move on to explain what premenstrual dysphoric disorder is. As part of their history, similar to the timeline that I made and put on the website and my Twitter and all, they say that PMDD is PMS, that it is like a subset of PMS. Now, in all the readings I've done with the books and scholarly articles that I've found, I've seen all sorts of different ways that authors explain PMDD. And I really like the way they put it in this book. We know that PMDD is cyclic, and in this writing, they say that normal ovarian functioning is the trigger, and that if you have PMDD, it's due to an abnormal biochemical response. And I guess I just never stopped to think that the uterus is doing what it's supposed to do. It's normal thing, that it's my body having almost like an allergy, an allergic reaction to the changing hormones caused by my body doing what it's normally supposed to do. Kind of like all the plant life in Northern California blooming like it's naturally supposed to, but meanwhile it's causing my itchy eyes, sneezing, scratchy throat, and making me hate nature. And sometimes it just takes a little sentence like that to make you stop and really kind of think about things. Um, they also stress the importance of tracking your symptoms and even recommend using a, re a regular monthly calendar. And to do this, you would mark the first day of your period as day one, count ahead 28 days or however many days your cycle normally is, and mark that as the anticipated first day of your next period. Then count back 10 days from that day and mark the day you expect your PMDD symptoms to begin. But even if you take the simple calendar method, you would still need to indicate the severity of your symptoms. Now we're getting into part two of the book, which starts with nutrition. They include a table to calculate daily protein needs for women, but it's from 1985, so I don't know how accurate it would be now. Like most other studies, the information they advise that sugar, refined carbohydrates are all bad for PMDD. And they list fiber and complex carbs as PMDD fighters. But of course, if you intake, increase your fiber intake, you'll also want to make sure you're getting plenty of water to help prevent constipation. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> in relation to things I previously mentioned about calcium, uh, an increase in fiber intake can decrease the absorption of calcium. So if you're taking calcium supplements, you wouldn't want to take them with your high fiber meal. You'll want to take them at a different time. They also take the time to discuss the different types of fats, and a little bit about cholesterol. Now, there's some additional tables listing common food items and their fat and cholesterol content amounts and the fiber content of some foods as well. Now, if you really want info on this, it might be better just to actually Google the, for this information because you would get something more current than what's in the book. Who knows how much of this is outdated, being that it was, what, what did I say, 17 years ago? So it's been a while. They cover several vitamins and minerals and their impact or lack of impact on PMDD symptoms. And ideally, at some point, I would like to gather all the information regarding vitamins and their benefits to list on my website just as a more simplified kind of go-to chart on, on what's been studied to help, uh, what still needs more study. So that's kind of uh, one short long-term goal of mine. Here again, calcium and magnesium are mentioned as being helpful. Calcium helps with proper nerve transmission and impulses, and magnesium helps to reduce symptoms due to its effects on serotonin. Now, if you recall, we've talked a lot about magnesium. And they give vitamin B6 the thumbs up, but say it's one that should be taken every day. 
not just before your period or when symptoms begin. The vitamin E can be helpful for breast pain or nostalgia and breast tenderness, though I think it's important to keep in mind that when, what may work for one person may not always work for another. Vitamin E and calcium may work for you, but maybe not so much for me. All depends on the person. Potassium is also listed as helping to relieve premenstrual symptoms, and I would really like to do some follow-up research on this because at the time of this writing, meaning the book, a quote-unquote preliminary uncontrolled study found that women with PMDD had complete resolution of symptoms in four cycles. Now that sounds a little too good to be true, right? I'm thinking it is. It's a little hard to believe that just one supplement was able to alleviate and eventually completely absolve, relieve all premenstrual symptoms in just four months. I mean, if that were the case and subse subsequent trials also found the same thing, wouldn't we all be on potassium supplements right now? There's a small paragraph about manganese, which was overall positive, but they did note that it needed more studies. And again, this was in 2002, so I don't know. There might have been more studies done since then. I'll have to look. Mental note. And of course, tryptophan is also mentioned here. It sounds positive within this writing, and they cite an incident in 1991 when some L-tryptophan supplements were removed from the market because several deaths were attributed to a contaminated batch of pills that were made in Japan. So while they do praise, say, the effects on PMDD symptoms are positive, that happened. So... I like how at the end of this chapter, they offer a summary on how to get everything working together. And the bullet points here are to lower your salt and sugar intake, up your water intake, and reduce or eliminate caffeine, which kind of tugged at my heartstrings. <laughs> I can deal with switching to decaffeinated tubes, but decaf coffee, that's just like useless brown water, right? <laughs> and they continue on with recommendations to either eliminate or moderate alcohol intake and to cease smoking, that is, if you are a smoker. And I like this recommendation of avoiding diet, diets with strict menu limitations. Any recommendation that allows me to eat what I want, I'm all for that. <laughs> you know, sometimes I joke about all the horrible foods that I crave when I'm PMDD, like french fries or chips, cookies, donuts, and so on. But now it does make a little more sense that this craving for carbs could be my body's way of signaling that my serotonin levels are low and it's something now that I can recognize and acknowledge. In regards to aerobic exercise, they note that it's not so much the intensity that matters, but the frequency of the exercise. And of course, the more often you exercise, the better the results for relief from PMDD and C uh, PMS symptoms will be. And there are some general guidelines for exercise, which are pretty typical, like do a warm up before you begin. You know, you don't want to just jump right into it and risk injuring yourself. Take it easy at first, you know, and just slowly work into things. Don't overdo it. Take time for a cool down. And again, be careful not to overdo it or overheat. Make sure you stay hydrated during, throughout your workout. Chapter five gets into alternative therapies, integrative medicine therapies like herbs. But herbs are not held to the same standards of testing for effectiveness or safety as traditional medications. And they discuss the ones that are most com commonly advocated for premenstrual syndrome. So we're just kind of going to bullet point these and I'm just going to give a br brief summary of uh, what they found. So evening primrose oil had only been found to help with breast tenderness. Chase tree berry. Tests found that it helped to relieve symptoms like anger, headache, bloating, and mood changes, but unsafe to take while pregnant or trying to get pregnant. St. John's wort reduces premenstrual symptoms by helping to increase serotonin levels, but it also reduces the effectiveness of oral contraceptives and blood thinners. And some other cautions like affecting tumor suppressing gene um, that can increase the risk of ovarian and breast cancer in women who have this gene. So that's... That's a little scary to me. Uh, valerian root helps with sleep, but dependency can follow with extended use. Not good in my eyes. I don't think I don't, my, my feeling. Black cohosh, a thought to relieve, uh, relieve pain associated with premenstrual symptoms, but recommended to not be used longer than three to six months. Ginseng. To sum up the description on this herb, it's basically better to avoid it. Let's just get that out there. <laughs> Dong Kwai, hopefully I said that right, 
also like ginseng, probably best to skip. Uh, neither, at least at the time of this publication, did have a consistent evidence to support their effectiveness in helping PMDD symptoms. So if you're avoiding any two for sure, it would probably be ginseng and don't quiet, at least according to this book. In the writing, they also touch a little bit on the body circadian rhythm. And I mean a little, there's like two sentences on it. Um, but they suggest going to bed by 10 p.m. and waking at 6 p.m. because this is the schedule at which the Earth's energy enhances human energy. Which sounds like an amazing thing, but I've done that and I still wake up needing my coffee right away. They discuss quite a bit about traditional Chinese medicine and its tenets, um, Ayurvedic medicine and the balance of the body's three energies, and craniosacral therapy. I'm going to have to find a YouTube on this because it sounds pretty interesting. Craniosacral therapy is the belief that a cerebral spinal fluid in your brain and your spinal cord moves from your head to the bottom of your spine in rhythm rhythmic waves occurring in 6 to 10 cycles per minute. And these therapists de detect this motion with their hands by feeling your head and detecting points in which the flow is restricted. Now, I'm not sure how they achieve this, but by manipulating the bones of the skull, these therapists are somehow able to restore normal flow of the cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid. I'm not going to lie. Sounds a little out there to me, but it might be worth doing some investigating just to see what it's all about. And the authors point out areas where improvement is needed in both herbal and alternative medicines. And of course, there's the placebo effect to consider when looking at things like this. It's something that is scientifically helping, or is it more anecdotal history to them being helpful? Like, I remember once hearing that chicken soup actually does nothing to help a cold, but it's been passed down as a remedy for so many years that our belief is that it really does help, and our belief in that is what actually helps to heal us. Chapter 6 goes into medications and hormonal treatments that are typically recommended for PMDD. And like the PMDD Phenomenon book, they also break down the benefits and cautions, but I feel like this book spends a little more time on each. And similarly, they also talk about methods to stop ovulation, like the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, surgical removal of the ovaries as well. There's also a short paragraph about danitol, which is a weak synthetic androgen or male hormone, but I think they discuss it more for the fact to emphasize that it's a not, not a helpful option for PMDD treatment. And to kick off chapter 7, they state that women with PMDD are more likely to have ongoing issues with stress. And applying that statement to myself, I thought it was odd because I feel like I don't really get stressed out that often. Like, it takes a lot to for me to be like, yes, I am stressed. But not to say there aren't things in my life that could trigger stress. I just don't feel like it's ever really been an issue for myself personally. But as the chapter went on, I think what um, I am what they refer to as a stress hardy person. And these are people with personalities that tend to accept changes um, and see them as opportunities for growth and get more involved in problem solving. And that sounds like me to a T. When a problem or challenge comes up, I maybe have one second of stress, you know, that's exaggerating, but just a quick kind of like, oh crap, but then right away go into problem solving mode and be like, okay, what are we going to do to fix this? I don't, because to me, dwelling on it, getting stressed about it is not helping me, uh, not helping anyone really, but not helping me physically, emotionally, mentally. So might as well, like, what's the point? To me, really. But I can say from experience that stress can totally mess with your cycle. The one of the few times that I can recall recently of experiencing stress, um, a few years ago there were really bad fires in the city. Like like seriously, half the city was on fire one night and whole neighborhood no whole neighborhoods were gone. Um, we were evacuated at like one in the morning and we were out of our condo for about three weeks living in my boyfriend's father's RV and just kind of doing what we could and the way my body decided to respond was by starting my period a week early so that was like the nice little cherry on the cake unfortunately for us women stress hormones stay in our bloodstream longer than it does for men you know like there weren't already enough challenging things about being a woman come on and of course following the discussion about stress the book talks about methods to management 
and one way is the deep belly breathing that I've mentioned before. And they also walk you through progressive muscle relaxation, which is tightening your muscles for a few seconds and then releasing them suddenly. Typically working from the top to the bottom of your body or opposite direction, just going in order kind of helps to focus on the exercises. And funny enough, this was something I had tried to help uh, with my own anxiety about flying. I would say focus on my toes, clenching them and then releasing them really quickly. Then move on to the upper portions of my leg and so on. And really on any muscle that I felt I could tighten or flex and then release. And I think it helped more um, because it gave me a mental distraction from thinking like, oh my God, I'm stuck on this plane for X amount of hours, nowhere to go. But music and movies have now given me enough of a distraction from that and now staying to stay relaxed during turbulence instead of practicing that muscle tightening and releasing I close my eyes and picture a plane moving down a road and the road is just bumpy here and there and I'm telling myself and that's that's normal it's okay so I literally envision a plane kind of driving down the road and think to myself it's just a bumpy part of the road And that visualization has completely changed how I feel about turbulence now. But back to PMDD. There's a pretty good chapter about cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, including a case study. Now I recall Dr. Tori, which I hope she doesn't mind me calling her that, um, responding on my Twitter that she recommends dialectic behavioral therapy or DBT versus CBT for PMDD because the intense emotions of PMDD aren't primarily caused by cognitive distortions. Now, you think I had enough acronyms in that sentence? My God. Um, (laughs) They're both forms of talk therapy, and from what I found, CBT primarily focuses on reconstructing thoughts, focusing on how your thoughts can influence on your, your emotions. DBT teaches you that your experiences are real and valid, and helps and teaches you how to accept who you are. Now, this is barely touching on the surface of it all, but I thought it was worth mentioning the difference. And they review a couple models of CBT. One is rational emotive therapy, which holds that our problems develop from our views or beliefs about events rather than external events. And they go on to describe theories and beliefs that I felt I couldn't accurately summarize without reading them word for word for the book, but it does make you think about the why and how we think and feel. And there is a sample of what you call, or what they call, a thought record in the book. And it has a great list of words for feelings as help. Like multiple words to say you're sad. And all, you know, basically as if you were looking at the source. And as I looked at this record and reviewed about CBT, it got me thinking about stories. And we create stories for almost everything, every feeling and scenario. And it helps to stop and look at what are the stories and what are really the facts. What, you know, what are the hard facts? And what are we making up that is making us feel this way? And everything does take practice. It does take some time to train yourself to remember to stop and ask yourself why you're feeling certain emotions or reacting in a certain way. And it's something I personally have been trying to be better at as well. Chapter 9 reviews the three most common mental disorders that can coexist with PMDD. And I don't know if this list might be different now, but this is what it was at the time. The three are generalized anxiety disorder. dysthymia, hopefully I said that right, a major depressive disorder, and they provide case examples for each to better illustrate how they can appear and coexist with PMDD. And the last chapter is pretty short. It summarizes and wraps up everything. And here is where that also, um, where there's also a small part for partners of PMDD sufferers. Some of the tips they give include conveying that you are there for support, Lots of warm hugs and reassurance that you find, you know, her attractive because one of the symptoms, um, as you may experience yourself, is our self-esteem just, like, plummets. It's like we feel we're not good enough, you know, we're very self-deprecating. It gets bad. Um, And for the PMDD supporter to actually listen to their partner. I feel like this was common, kind of common sense, but they also suggest not bringing up any issues that could trigger emotions like rage or anger when you recognize that your partner's PMDD is occurring. And I'm sorry, but that would just be like asking for trouble. <laughs> 
And I love this example they provide from a psychologist with the University of California, San Francisco. And I'm going to change it a little, but the point is still the same. If your PMDD partner is ready to bulldoze the house because you forgot to pick up toilet paper on the way home, disregard the rage about, or not disregard, but regard the rage about one-tenth of what it seems. Acknowledge and admit that you actually did forget the toilet paper, and then, as I say, quote-unquote, withdraw from the field of battle. I feel that during PMDD weeks, there will often be possible times for conflict, but having an understanding and working through it will make all the difference. And that about wraps up this book. Uh, Like the PMDD phenomenon, there's a wealth of information here, and I would recommend it. I just really wish there were updated versions of both of these books. And like the Phenomenon book, it's really easy to read. While there are some scientific terms related to psychology and biology, like masturbation, not to be confused with a very similar sounding word, they do a great job of explaining and defining things and putting it in a way that's easy to understand. So this one, uh, this book, and the PMDD Phenomenon book are two I would definitely recommend. And while these books are older and some, or a lot, of the information is outdated, I feel like it's helpful to know anyway because then you get a history and more of an understanding of how science and research has gotten to where it is now and what things have gone through. Now, about that appendix with recipes, because I love food, <laughs> they, suggest to, they suggest foods to limit and others to increase to help with your symptoms. And the recipes included are grilled chicken with pasta and spinach, shrimp or chicken breast stir-fry, grilled halibut with citrus salsa, which sounds so good, citrus roasted salmon, grilled chicken breast with plum sauce, fresh veggie salad, autumn acorn squash soup. Am I making you hungry yet? My stomach is about to growl. Walnut and pasta salad, and some other small items like pumpkin muffins and fresh, uh, fresh fruit drink. As I already said, I would definitely recommend this book, and I purchased it off Amazon for a reasonable price, and I felt it was 100% worth it. And thank you for listening. I hope you learned a few new things. Um, Next time, or next books I'll be reading are the PMDD Handbook for Partners and PMDD in Relationships, Living on a Prayer with PMDD by Leanna Leverance. Um, I gotta get better with names. (laughs) Um, but we'll have more, I'll have more information then, uh, a lot more to discuss. There's always so much more to learn. want to wish you all a wonderful day, evening, night, wherever you may be, and I will see you next time. Bye.